OK, to outer space now and the first demonstration of interstellar navigation, which comes from the New Horizons spacecraft. And that's just left the solar system not long ago. Yeah, so this is involving a spacecraft that launched nearly 20 years ago and it's now left the solar system using a surprisingly old-fashioned method for navigation. So when sailors use the stars to navigate the seas or, or sailors of old, um, they essentially triangulated their position against the stars. And we've got Alex Wilkins here today to explain how that works and how you use it for a spacecraft. And, and also, haven't we had other spacecraft like, I'm thinking of Voyager, leave the solar system before? What, what's the new thing here? Yeah, you're, so you're, you're completely right there. We've had five satellites have left the solar system. Four of those launched in the 70s, so the two Pioneer satellites and the two Voyager satellites. Pioneer, we've lost contact with both of them, but Voyager are still active. And then we had New Horizons, which, as you said, launched in 2006. And the neat thing about New Horizons is it's got this camera on it, which can be used to take pictures of things mm. such as stars. So what astronomers have now done is they've used New Horizons camera to take pictures of stars and then use that to navigate through deep space basically by almost like those sailors but in a slightly different way. It's worth pointing out here that the way sailors use stars to navigate, they had this essentially fixed background of the sky so the stars weren't moving, they were moving against it. Whereas New Horizons, it's traveled so far from Earth that the stars have actually shifted in their position, they're no longer fixed and that's what allows them to navigate using this effect called stellar parallax. That's a really cool term. So parallax is this effect where an object appears to shift against its background if you look at it from a different angle. Um, and you can do this yourself if you close one eye and then the other, mm. that what you can see moves relative to its background. Um, I remember seeing a few years ago that they'd first seen this effect with New Horizons. Yeah, exactly. So they looked at these two nearby stars, Proxima Centauri and Wolf 359. And the spacecraft at this point was so far from the solar system, 8 billion kilometers roughly, uh, that the stars' positions were noticeably shifted. Mm. Astronomers can actually measure stellar parallax from Earth as well, like putting a telescope on one side of the Earth and then looking at it from the other. But that effect is so tiny, you need quite advanced telescopes and you can't see it by eye. But when you look at these stars that New Horizons took and you compare it to photos we've seen from Earth, then the effect is really pronounced. Like you can see it actually shifts in the picture itself by a couple of centimetres, obviously, magnified. And it's actually the biggest stellar parallax we've ever seen, given how far this spacecraft is. Mm, so it feels quite intuitive, but this is actually the first time we've, we've taken such good pictures of it in that, in that kind of level of detail. Exactly, yeah. Um, I have to say that I'm glad they chose Wolf 359, because you've seen that episode of Star I'm Trek. I'm familiar, yeah. You're familiar with that. Well, it's, <laughs> no, I'm not. What are we talking about? Oh, it's a famous episode of Star Trek <laughs> right. Next Generation where there's a huge battle at, at Wolf 359. I thought I was missing some kind of niche, it, it, interesting science about <laughs> Wolf 359. No. That, that um, so to me. get back to the science, but uh, f how do they go from measuring the, the location of the spacecraft now in New Horizons? So the missing ingredient in all this is the Gaia Space Telescope. Um, so this is this telescope that launched uh, over a decade ago now and collected the positions of loads of stars in our galaxy, really precise distances and, and kind of angles. Um, and so because we have this amazing 3D map of all the stars in our galaxy, we can reference that parallax shift from the New Horizons camera and then kind of wow. map it out yeah. and basically almost triangulate it like yeah. you were saying with the sailors earlier. And how accurate then is uh, when you use this method to work out the location of your interstellar spacecraft. Is, is this actually useful? Could we use it one day to navigate? Maybe. The, <laughs> so the, the gold standard we have for tracking spacecraft in outer space is a thing called the Deep Space Network, which is run by NASA. And that's basically a collection of radio telescopes uh, based around Earth that will ping out these signals into space and then any spacecraft can pick them up, basically time how they're coming in and use that to work out their distance. This is really accurate and can locate spacecraft within about tens of meters. By comparison, the interstellar method is much less accurate. It can narrow down New Horizons to within a 60 million kilometer radius. <laughs> 60 or, million. <laughs> yeah, so not, not quite as accurate. That, that's about half the distance between Earth and the Sun for comparison. Yeah, ballpark. But, yeah, I mean, it is a, not a bad ballpark yeah, yeah. Given, the, given the range we're talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, the, the astronomer that I spoke to who led the work, Todd Lauer, 
he was honest and said they probably wouldn't be putting the Deep Space Network out of business anytime <laughs> soon. And this is only a demo proof of concept. The astronomer also thought that we could improve the accuracy by about 10 to 100 by changing the camera or kind of using different methods. It's still going to be millions of kilometers out. Yeah, yeah. But it is worth saying that as the satellite gets further and further away from Earth, the Deep Space Network will actually take longer and longer to measure. So if you're close to another star and Earth is light years away, then you'll have to wait a year for that mm. signal to come back. So actually, it might be much quicker for the spacecraft to navigate by itself just by looking at the stars. Cool. So next time we do have a, a mission that's many light years away, we can rely on this, but that's not going to happen anytime soon, is it? Yeah, sadly, we don't have any interstellar missions planned on the horizon. Okay. Despite all that, there is a beautiful story here that traces back to the original explorers that we were sort of alluding to, these early mm. sailors. Um, and the paper that you've reported on, Alex. It was dedicated to Chad Kalepa Bebeyan, who's a master Polynesian, uh, Polynesian navigator. Uh, he dedicated his life to the teaching and demonstration of the ancient Polynesian science of maritime and celestial navigation mm. over the vast reaches of the Pacific Ocean and beyond. Um, and they colla the authors collaborated with him on this. So, yeah, it's a real um, symbiosis of old and new here. Oh, how lovely. Um, OK, let's get to the kind of breaking interstellar news this week. Yeah. We've just detected an interstellar object approaching our solar yeah, system. Yeah. This is like the third one, only the third one we've yeah, detected. Yeah. So this one has got provisional name A11PL3Z. Brilliant. Uh, it's actually just been given an official name, breaking news. It's now called Atlas. Atlas. I'm a little bit disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to take it up with the astronomers. Who, who, um, I thought there's some process because we got Ua, we had Uamura in 2017, then um, Borisov in 2019, and now Atlas. I think mm. they've named this after the telescope they used for it or the, or the warning system they used for it. Fair mm, enough. Okay. Um, so that's three, like you say, three observations. That's a trend. <laughs> it's come, that, that means they are, there is a visiting trend a big to come to our, on Earth, exactly. <laughs> to our system. So uh, are we going to be able to study it? What could it tell us? Uh, yes, we will, hopefully. <laughs> um, so we think at the moment it's about 20 kilometres wide uh, and looks to be travelling around 60 kilometres per second towards Earth. That's going to speed up as it goes towards the sun, where the sun's gravity will kind of have this slingshot approach. Um, and it will reach its closest point in October, passing close to Jupiter uh, and within two astronomical units of Earth. So that's distance between Earth and the sun. But because we've actually seen it coming in, now we can prepare for it. We can get all the Earth's telescopes kind of ready and pointing at it. So we should be able to get some interesting information on this. Um, the other ones, we kind of didn't have as much advance warning and we kind of saw them as they were leaving a bit. Unfortunately, we can't launch a mission because it's moving so fast. By the time that we get the mission ready and the spacecraft gets there, it'll be long gone. Mm. But even so, we will get loads of useful and interesting information about where this thing came from and, and what it might be made because of. Because with Oumuamua, there wasn't that much information we could get. So that le that allowed a gap of speculation from some people about its, uh, you know, it was an alien object. Exactly. Whereas, yeah. um, whereas this, we can probably forestall that by the amount of data we're going to be able to get. Hopefully, or find out that it is aliens after all. <laughs> I can't wait to know what shape it is. We don't know that yet, right? Do no, we? the last one, it was, Oumuamua was either a long cigar shape yep. or a big flat disc. Maybe this will be something new altogether <laughs> or one of those. 